it's a wonderful opportunity for me to present the work of my group that started three years ago at the Center for Integrative Genomics in Lausanne. So thank you very much to the Inc. and the organizers. And I'll tell you today about our work on gene insulation in Drosophila. So genes are turned on and off in precise spatial and temporal patterns that are often critical for gene function. And these mRNA in situ hybridizations show examples of gene expression patterns of different developmental genes in Drosophila embryos. So we study, like Sarah said, how gene silencing and activating influences are organized without undesirable crosstalk. And Drosophila is a valuable model for studying how specific gene expressions arise because it's, it's experimentally tractable and it has a very well characterized development. So transcription from gene promoters is controlled by regulatory elements like enhancers or silencers that recruit transcription factors in specific cells to turn transcription on or off in these cells. So we know quite a bit about where promoters and regulatory elements are in genomes. And the challenge now is to, collect, to connect regulatory elements to their target genes, which is not trivial because regulatory elements often don't simply regulate the closest gene. They, and, and they frequently have the potential uh, to regulate wrong targets. So genomes fold into physical contact domains defined by enhanced interactions within them. And regulatory elements uh, have been observed to be frequently located in the same contact domain as their target promoters. And therefore contact domains may be important for bridging regulatory elements to their target genes and to prevent crosstalk between contact domains. And contact domains can be visualized by a technique called Hi-C, which generates heat maps of cross-linking frequencies between pairs of loci as a proxy for how close they are in 3D space. And contact domains can be thought of as dynamic ensembles of conformations that loci tend to explore over time. So in mammals, a large fraction of contact domain boundaries are occupied by a sequence-specific DNA binding protein called CTCF. And these domains form when cohesin, which is a ring-shaped protein complex with ATPase activity, extrudes chromatin loops and becomes stalled or stabilized at convergently oriented bound CTCF motifs. So depleting CTCF leads to blurred contact domain boundaries and uncovers an evolutionarily conserved level of genome folding called compartmentalization which reflects the, the fact that active and inactive uh, regions of the, chrome of, of the genome occupy separate volumes in the nucleus. They're physically separated. So overall, a large fraction of domain boundaries and vertebrates are CTCF dependent. And therefore, CTCF could potentially be a very important protein to regulate uh, gene specificity, the specificity of gene regulation. But this hypothesis is challenging to address in mammalian cells because global perturbation of CTCF leads to cell death. And instead of depleting CTCF globally, you know, specific binding sites, CTCF binding sites in the genome can be deleted. But this has led to very different effects depending on the locus uh, that was manipulated. And therefore the functional importance of genome folding into CTCF dependent domains has remained a little uh, mysterious, not well understood. So Drosophila have widespread contact domains and they have CTCF, but it was unclear whether CTCF dependent domains exist. And this is because high C maps that were generated in, in flies didn't show hallmarks of CTCF mediated domains. So for example, CTCF did not seem to be clearly enriched at domain boundaries. And so instead, it was proposed that fly contact domains merely you know, uh, come from compartmentalization. And we figured that clarifying whether or not Drosophila has CTCF dependent domains was important to understand the relevance of CTCF dependent domains for genome function. 
And so we generated flies that completely lack CTCF and asked what happens to gene transcription? What happens to contact domains? And we also asked whether CTCF partners with other proteins that are important for its function. So what happens to flies when you remove CTCF? So we deleted the CTCF open reading frame and replaced it with a selective marker. And our CTCF knockouts could be rescued by a genomic fragment. So this is an anti-CTCF Western blot on extracts of early embryos that are wild type or CTCF knockout. And you can see that CTCF protein is still detected early in development because the mothers of these flies pump CTCF mRNA and protein into their eggs. And this maternally contributed CTCF protein partially rescues these knockout mutants. And so we made more severe mutants that we call CTCF0 that lack both maternal and zygotic CTCF protein. And these mutants nevertheless progress quite far in development. They die as pupae that never hatch from the pupal case. And so CTCF0 mutants dissected from the pupal case have homeotic transformations in their abdomen. So these are transformations in the identities of abdominal segments that are caused by misexpression of Hox body patterning genes. And CTCF binds at the boundaries of regulatory domains that each are responsible for driving appropriate levels of a Hox gene called abdominal B in each body segment. And so this phenotype suggested that CTCF is required to insulate abdominal B regulatory domains and allow them to function autonomously in each body segment. And so therefore CTCF has a uh, conserved function in Hox gene regulation, as shown also in mouse uh, motor neurons by the Reinberg lab. So if we look more globally, how is transcription impacted in CTCF0 mutants? But first we were wondering where should we actually look for gene expression defects? So we performed tissue specific rescue and knockout experiments to find whether CTCF is particularly important in a specific cell type. So these are wild type flies, and these are CTCF knockout mutants. So with maternal CTCF, because CTCF zero wouldn't be alive at this stage. And we notice that they have spasmatic mutant, uh, spasmatic phenotypes, movements, that suggested that they had neurological defects. So by providing CTCF back only in neural stem cells of CTCF zero mutants, which normally never hatch, they were brought back to life. And conversely, if we deleted CTCF only in neural stem cells, the flies were almost as sick as CTCF knockout mutants that lack CTCF everywhere. So therefore, CTCF seems to play an important role in the nervous system. And we therefore performed all experiments in dissected central nervous systems of third instar larvae, which is a developmental stage at which CTCF zero mutants are fully viable. So we sequenced mRNAs of wild type and CTCF0 dissected central nervous systems. And 3% of all genes were differentially expressed. So some genes failed to be expressed at normal levels and several other genes were abnormally activated in the nervous system. Like this gene thrombospondin, which is normally only expressed in tendons. So in the case of thrombospondin, CTCF bound at a distance from the misregulated promoter in between genes that are neuronally expressed and genes that should normally not be. And so these results suggested either that CTCF may be activating or repressing genes depending on the locus, or alternatively, it may be shielding or insulating promoters from inappropriate enhancers or silencers. And to distinguish between these possibilities, we tested uh, CTCF peaks in a quantitative reporter essay. So in this reporter, green and red reporter genes are equidistant from a common enhancer that boosts their transcription. And we cloned test fragments in between GFP and the enhancer. And the reporters then transiently transfected into Drosophila cells and fluorescence is measured in thousands of single cells with a cell analyzer. So in the absence of an insulator, so we were just with a neutral spacer, every cell has comparable levels of both reporters. But when we clone 
a very well characterized Drosophila insulator. It's a, it's a DNA fragment that is not bound by CTCF. Um, cells still had high M cherry, but basal GFP. So levels uh, that were comparable to what we measure in a reporter that lacks an enhancer. And so therefore, you know, uh, this insulator does not seem to actively repress GFP transcription. It only seems to prevent its enhancer mediated, act mediated activation. And two CTCF peaks near genes with expression decreased or increased in CTCF zero mutants. So these are from the example loci I showed you before, had similar effects as Gypsy. And so we tested several sites and found that the degree to which uh, the GFP was reduced scaled with how much CTCF binds to this site, okay, in, in the cell line that was transfected. And also that point mutating the CTCF motif killed the activity of these fragments. And so we conclude that at least in this reporter essay, CTCF does not directly repress or activate transcription. Instead, it insulates a promoter from an enhancer. Okay, so what is the molecular mechanism by which CTCF impacts transcription? So we joined forces with Ares Lieberman Aiden and applied a low input high C protocol developed in his lab to central nervous systems of wild type and CTCF0 larvae. So here are wild type high C maps, the contact domain boundaries that we called computationally, CTCF chip seq and mRNA seq tracks with genes that were differentially expressed in CTCF0 highlighted in pink. So one observation, the first one, is that we found fewer CTCF peaks than contact domain boundaries. So whereas CTCF peaks were frequently located at boundaries, uh, only CTCF was only present at about 8% of all contact domain boundaries. Second observation was that wild type and CTCF0 high C maps were globally similar, except that specific boundaries at former CTCF peaks, right? Because CTCF is gone in the mutants, were disrupted, okay? In CTCF0 mutants. At other boundaries, uh, at other CTCF peaks, boundaries were still present, although they were measurably weaker. And this suggested that redundant boundary forming mechanisms synergize with CTCF at these sites. And I'll come back to this. So I told you that mammalian CTCF forms boundaries by stalling cohesin. And the Pane and Nora labs recently showed that the mammalian CTCF N-terminus directly interacts with cohesin. But fly and human CTCF N-termini are barely conserved, except for a 10 amino acid stretch that directly interacts with cohesin. So we found that fly CTCF N-terminus made in bacteria pulls down a, a fly a RAD21 stromalin cohesin subcomplex. And that mutating two amino acids that are critical in human CTCF for interacting with cohesin killed you know, this interaction. And so therefore we think it's likely that CTCF and might also likely form as a barrier to loop extruding cohesin in flies. Okay, so then we asked the CTCF associate with important partner proteins. And we purified CTCF interactors from Drosophila embryonic nuclear extracts. And we found known insulator uh, binding proteins in green, like CT190, IBF1, and IBF2, as highly enriched in our pull down relative to a negative control. And we also found traces of cohesin complex members reminiscent of transient interactions between cohesin and CTCF in mammalian cells. So using recombinant proteins, we found that this uh, small region in, in CTCF C terminus directly interacts with the BTB domain of CT190. So what is the relevance of this interaction? So these are all contact domain boundaries that we identified by high C in larval central nervous systems. And they're ranked by insulation defects observed in CTCF zero mutants. So the most affected boundaries are the ones that are normally bound by CTCF and wild type. So these are 
are CTCF dependent boundaries. So unlike CTCF, CT190 binds to nearly all contact domain boundaries as also seen by the Cavalli, Manke, Shao, and other labs. And CTCF helps, which I showed you directly interacts with CT190, helps recruit it to this subset of boundaries. And this is more clear in the differential analysis looking at CP190 binding in CTCF0 mutants compared to wild type. So it's lower here. So if we focus on this, you know, 8% of boundaries that are occupied by CTCF and also rank them by insulation defects in CTCF mutants. So obviously, yes, they are bound by CTCF. They're co-bound by CP190 in a strictly at the top or only partially CTCF dependent manner. So CP190 binding is most affected. In fact, it's gone at many sites from the strongly affected boundaries and it's still detectable at weakly affected boundaries. And residual CP190 binding at former CTCF peaks well, in CTCF0 mutants was significantly associated with boundary retention. So 75% of our strictly CTCF dependent boundaries, so those are the ones that completely disappear in CTCF0 mutants, lacked residual CP190. And 80% of residual CP190 peaks were associated with a residual boundary in CTCF0. And you can see this in this example. So this is, uh, you know, high C maps again, the CTCF chip, CP190 chip signal in wild type and in CTCF0 mutant larval central nervous systems. And asterisks mark CP190 peaks in CTCF0 mutants that are less bound than in wild type. So solid arrowheads mark strictly CTCF dependent boundaries. Okay, these are boundaries that completely disappear in the mutant. And at these sites, CP190 is completely lost. Whereas uh, the empty arrowheads mark boundaries that are you know, measurably weaker, but clearly still there in CTCF0 mutants. And they still have measurable CP190 binding, though it is reduced compared to wild type. Okay, so is CP190 important for CTCF function? So we performed RNA-seq on central nervous systems of CP190 knockout larvae and found a, common, a list of common genes that were similarly differentially expressed in CTCF0 and in CP190 knockout mutants. And SP1029 was one of those examples. So it's a gene that's close to a CTCF and CP190 co-bound peak. In CTCF0 mutants, CP1, so that lacks CTCF, CP190 is completely lost from these peaks. A contact domain boundary is completely gone, which I'm not showing you. And the gene was expressed at higher levels relative to wild type. So in CP190 knockout mutants, CP190 is gone, but CTCF has no problems, you know, finding its site. Nevertheless, SP1029 is also expressed at increased levels, similar, you know, to CTCF0 mutants. So this suggests that CP190 is required for CTCF function independently of CTCF binding to DNA. So to more stringently compare SP1029 misexpression in the absence of CTCF or CP190, we visualized SP1029 mRNAs in embryos completely lacking maternal and zygotic CTCF. So these are the CTCF zero mutants I've talked about, or CP190 zero mutants. And already at 11 hours of development, CTCF zero and CP190 zero mutants ectopically express SP1029 in the same cells. So the arrowhead is marking in the nervous system, but additionally in other cell types. And so we conclude that CP190 is a critical partner of CTCF for regulating a subset of common genes. So this model summarizes all our results. So we found that in Drosophila, CTCF is required to form 8% of all contact domain boundaries. And this strongly contrasts with the, with the mammalian genome 
where extrusion-based mechanisms are responsible for the formation of a large fraction of boundaries. And this demonstrates that although domain formation is ubiquitous in different species, the contributions of different mechanisms can vary widely. So we think that these are likely loop extruded tad, you know, contact domains or TADs, given CTCF's conserved ability to interact directly with cohesin. We also, you know, could found, but this was already known, that CTCF stably associates with CP190 and that CP190 binds to all boundaries. And we found that CTCF helps recruit CP190 to a subset of all boundaries. And partial retention of CP190 in CTCF0 mutants was significantly associated with partial boundary retention. So this suggests that either CP190 itself or factors that associate with CP190 can redundantly contribute to boundary formation independently of CTCF. And they may synergize with CTCF at some sites. So how does CTCF alter transcription? So we found that CTCF is most critically required in neurons. And we think that the lethality of CTCF0 mutants may be due to gene misexpression in neurons that arises when CTCF is no longer able to prevent crosstalk, regulatory crosstalk between contact domains. And finally, we found that you know, CTCF um, functionally cooperates with its stably bound cofactor CP190. And this expands the view of how CTCF may affect gene regulation. So coming back to my initial question, which was, what is the relevance of CTCF dependent domains you know, for gene regulation? We learned that although CTCF is essential for viability of flies, it, you know, CTCF is clearly dispensable for orchestrating other complex gene expression patterns. Uh, programs, because CTCF0 mutants progress quite far in development. And so this, you know, highlights that CTCF only provides one level of gene regulation specificity. And there are other strategies, obviously, that control whether or not regulatory elements and promoters functionally communicate. And so with this, I'd like to thank the lab, in particular, Anjali Kaschel, Giriram Mohana, Anastasia Semenova, and Pascal Cousin, and Isa Özdemir, who performed the work, and also uh, Erez Lieberman Aiden and Arena Omer for making the high seat possible. And Julien Dorier performed most of the computational analyses. And thank you very much again, and I'm happy to take any questions. My question, this was very interesting to me and I have a very, very nice talk and clean data. And more than a question, I have sort of a addition to what you said, the sense that um, by using different types of approach to analyze uh, contact data in the mammalian um, cell types, uh, we find very similar results to yours. In the sense that the impression we have is that uh, definitely CTC has played an important role However, in many cases, uh, it, is, it is acting in combination with other factors, not, not alone. It is a complexity of a combinatorial complexity of factors which interact with it to, to shape contact. And as you stress it, additionally, there are many cases where it is not in forming contact. So uh, this is definitely the picture that, that we are growing from the modeling side, say, so. Thank you, Mario. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, great to hear <laughs> that you're you're seeing similar things. Yeah. So we have a questions uh, from the Q and A. So from Radu Zabet. So according to your data, do you think that loop extrusion is a possible mechanism in Drosophila? Yeah. So so we think it's likely that uh, the CTCF dependent domains that we see are loop extruded um, because you know it's it's remarkable if you look at an alignment of the n terminus of CTCF between flies and humans it's almost only this tendon and acid stretch that has been shown to be required for cohesion interaction in human cells that's still present and uh, so it must be there for a reason so 
one of the things that still casts some doubt, however, is uh, the fact that Drosophila boundaries are not directional. They don't seem to be directional. And this was first seen by, by, um, by Rowley and Corsi's. And we, we see something similar. And so the reason of why, you know, if these are loop extruded boundaries, loop extruded contact domains, why are the boundaries not directional? Um, I guess our results, you know, would, would suggest that just uh, direct interaction between the N-terminus of CTCF and cohesion would not be sufficient to, to provide directionality. And actually it has been proposed um, that there are several other cohesion regulators that directly interact with, uh, you know, mammalian CTCF and not all of those interfaces are conserved in flies. And so maybe that's the reason why boundaries are not directional in flies, it's possible. So why, okay, so about CP190, whether, okay. So we, we hypothesize, right, that CP190 might, uh, might be contributing to boundary formation. We have yet to show that and whether this would also be in concert with cohesion, don't know. Don't know yet. It's a good question. Uh, Mark? My question is the following. Uh, your data shows clearly this uh, not necessity of CTCF in those boundaries. But I wonder if you have more temporal data in a sense that maybe the boundaries are maintained while the gene is not transcribed. We know in the Rosophila that trans gene transcription generates boundary by itself, or at least in, uh, as far as I understood the papers from Victor and many others. Um, what if these boundaries are not, so the CTCF permanence in those boundaries is not necessarily after you have activated transcription, for example. So in other words, do, can you measure these in a temporal manner? So, so if I understand correctly, you potentially, so what, what we see, so wherever CTCF sits, we, we very frequently see a boundary, right? But, but the thing is that um, in a CTCF zero mutant, only about a third of those boundaries are actually gone in the mutant and two thirds remain. And um, and so, our, if, if I understood correctly, you're you're you know you're bringing up the point that potentially transcription is influencing our results, yeah, and what we see. Yeah. So yeah. So what I can say is that uh, so we've we've seen that CTCF is very variably positioned relative to genes. So we see cases where CTCF is completely intergenic. At other cases, it's sitting almost at the transcription start site. And um, what we see though, however, in our RNA-seq data is we only saw misexpression, so detectable, you know, differential expression in CTCF zero mutants at a small fraction mm -hmm. of all CTCF peaks. And so therefore, you know, um, the boundary defects that we measure um, we think are not simply a consequence of transcription because we see the same kind of changes irrespective of whether, you know, CTCF is close to a promoter that doesn't change its expression or to a promoter whose transcription goes down or to a promoter, you know, whose expression increases. And so the fact that we always see this, you know, a weakening of boundaries irrespective of what's going on at a, a nearby promoter makes us think that th this is a, a structural um, thing that we're seeing and it's not influenced by transcription. Okay, thank you. But you, you raised a good point. It is something to keep in mind. Yeah, the transcription could be uh, affecting what we see. Yeah. I have actually two questions regarding this uh, organization. So you also know, I guess that uh, this, the TADs in Drosophila are also tightly associated with uh, chromatin domains or epigenetic domain. I mean, that was shown by also Giacomo uh, a few years ago and confirmed by modeling also. Yeah, but by you. Yeah. The question is I mean, do, do you see changes when you mutate your, I mean, in your CTCF KO? Did you see changes in the epigenetic landscape that could be associated with the insulator properties of CTCF? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So we didn't do chip seek for histone modifications because uh, 
it was already technically challenging to hand dissect these brains, but uh, these central nervous systems, but they are quite diverse in terms of cell types. And so it's not like in cell culture where you can have more homogeneous things going on, but we, we did a compartmental analysis. So looking at A and B compartments and nothing changed. Even genes who's, who were, you know, that were differentially expressed in CTCF0, they did not switch compartments. Okay. And so, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know to what point histone modifications are spreading past former CTCF boundaries in CTCF0, but at least nothing drastic that would be sufficient to cause a change in compartment okay, that's of these bins, yeah. And, and also regarding this, this CP1 and uh, 19. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, do you have a high C map for the, the KO uh, uh, mutants? Because no. it's super interesting to see if this sure. is the, the, key, the key insulator. Sure, 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 sure. We, we didn't do for CP190 knockout. The reason being that uh, CP190 knockouts have maternally contributed CP190, right? Every knockout starts off development, right? And, and so this is confounding the, the results. And we couldn't use CP190 because they die too early. So this would require a completely different experimental setup than doing it uh, at an earlier developmental stage. And the results would not be, we wouldn't be able to compare them directly in this study mm, with okay. CTC0. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Uh, Thank you. So maybe one, okay, questions from the QA. So what could be the mechanisms? Uh, or maybe you already know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, okay, so the question is how, what are hypotheses of how CP190 actually acts as an insulator, um, insulator factor? So it could be by forming boundaries. Uh, it's not the hypothesis we favor. Um, but I can, yeah, I don't know yet, but this is, I think this is the million dollar question. And I think it's not as simple. I think it's not as simple as simply providing a boundary that, you know, prevents 3D interactions or limits 3D interactions between things. I think it's something different, but I cannot yet say for sure. Yeah, we're studying that. Thanks. And uh, I think we are done with the question. Maybe I can ask one more because I'm curious about, did you look at the pairing? If I mean, if you if your CTC hmm. mutants have changed in, in terms of pairing? You mean trans contacts between homologs? Yes, yes. The homo yeah, no, we didn't look. Uh, last question, maybe okay. the answer. Could it be a kind of long range sure. delivery? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, it could. I mean, CP190 has been uh, the, the, the Corsi's original model, Victor Corsi's lab uh, model suggests that CP190, um, you know, is actually causing clustering of, of, of insulators together in, in 3D space into insulator bodies. And yeah, could be, could be. But how, how exactly this would work to, to shield the promoter from, from an enhancer is still, still, yeah, we have to think about it mm -hmm. beyond artistic representations, what it actually means molecularly. It's a yeah, million dollar question. <laughs>